We have a, a theory which is called quantum electrodynamics, which is our pride and joy. It's so successful and it's such, so wide in its application. And what I would like to tell you about is that theory, how it works, or how it looks like it works, and what the world looks like from that point of view. The uh, physics has got a history, at least a theoretical history, of uh, synthesis perpetually. Of course, the experiment is always finding new phenomena. The problem is to work them together, and sometimes we see that they're different aspects of the same phenomenon. An example is, of course, the simplest and earliest one is that the laws of motion became, in the theory, explained the properties of heat, because heat was motion, and if you knew how motion worked, you could understand the thermal, thermal properties. It also explained the properties of sound, which is otherwise a mystery, as the motion of the atoms and waves and the gas. On side from that, uh, knowing the laws of motion, you had to know Newton, who gave us the laws of, worked out the laws of motion, also gave us another theory about the forces between large masses and distances from one another called the theory of gravity. So that's just, uh, that thing, the theory of gravity, is not as well known and understood pretty well, but is not what I'm going to talk about. As the time went on, phenomena associated with electricity, you know, rubbing combs in your hair and things like that, and magnetism became uh, interesting to the experimental physicists, and they discovered the relations between them experimentally until they saw, ultimately, they were not two different phenomena, but different aspects of the, of the same thing. Another phenomenon that Newton had studied was light. So without time, it looked at first like there were many things, motion and gravity, electricity and magnetism later, and light. But when uh, Maxwell put together the laws of electricity and magnetism, he found out that the behavior that the equations that he had produced expectation that would be behavior of waves that would propagate at a speed, which was figured out from electrical measurements, but came out the same as the speed that light actually propagated. And so there was a new theory of light, which is that it was an electromagnetic wave, and Maxwell's great synthesis in 1873 was to connect electricity, magnetism, and light. Light is just one aspect of the electromagnetic wave, which can have different kinds of wavelengths from that point of view. And if you have different wavelengths, if the wavelength is very short between about four hundred millionths of a meter, no, of a centimeter, four hundred millionths of a centimeter, and 700 millionths of a centimeter, then you see it directly with the eye. But if it gets longer, the wave is, well, it's a long end, it's red, and then the other end, it's blue. And if it gets more longer than the red, we call it infrared, the rays are there, but the eye doesn't see them. The pit viper has an eye that sees the infrared. And if you go in the other direction, to the beyond the violet, then we can't see it again, but the bee has an eye that sees the ultraviolet. And, uh, if we go still further to the far ultraviolet, no animal has it that can see it, but we can make instruments that detect it, or photographic plates, and so on, up into x-rays and so forth. And down in the other direction, far infrared, uh, you get into radio waves, and we can build instruments that detect them, and we can use them to advertise soap. <laughs> in, it, in addition, so that, that is an enormous range of one property, the wavelength a range of phenomena that's a complete enormous spectrum. The spectrum we see with the eye is a very narrow range, and it's the entire spectrum. It's all put together with the one theory of electromagnetic waves. I'm going to talk about that part of it, that I'm going to call it light, instead of saying electromagnetic radiation. Light is what we see, is only one little part, but from the physicist's point of view, the accident that the human eye happens to be sensitive to waves from here to here is not essential. The phenomena are the same you know, over the whole range, and uh, we call, I'm going to call them all light, but it could be radio waves or x-rays or what have you. Next thing that was discovered was the structure of the atoms, and that, um, I'd like to remind you that you have, I believe, a Nobel Prize winner from New Zealand before, Mr. Rutherford, who was, I believe, a New Zealander who worked out that the atoms had nuclei. You know, it seems always here, I've only been here a few days, so everybody's talking themselves down. I thought this would be a happy country, but something's happened to you. 
We've got plenty of room and not too many people, and it looks like it ought to be good. Anyway, you do. Don't forget you had Rutherford, so it's okay. <laughs> Anyhow, he had a theory of the... He developed the, our understanding of the atoms as having a tiny core, it's very heavy, with the particles going around it, electrons. Now, supposing that the electrons went around according to the laws of motion of Newton, some properties of matter could be understood supposing the atoms were made that way. But most of the time, it failed. And it became more and more of a crisis in physics to understand what matter was like, uh, because it looked so obviously right that it had to be electrons going around nuclei, and yet nothing worked when you worked it out. And the discovery was made then in the discovery of quantum mechanics, first in the behavior of light and then in the behavior of matter, and finally culminating in 1926 with the full equation of quantum mechanics, which told us that the laws of motion of Newton were not right and had to be modified to other laws, which are quantum laws of motion. And when this uh, quantum laws of motion were applied to electrons to explain the properties of matter, it was a fantastic success. The properties of the atoms can be all worked out mathematically, in principle at least, into simple atoms in detail. And therefore, the theory behind chemistry, which atoms combine with which, at what rate, and so forth, is in principle. Theoretical chemistry deeply is physics. <laughs> it's not a joke. It's a direct, the chemist will admit that's exactly his point of view, that the understanding of the atoms in the deepest level is physical physics, except that the atoms have so many particles in them, it's very hard to calculate what's going to happen. So he has to use a lot of empirical rules to help him. But in, as far as we can tell, there's nothing about chemistry that's not understood ultimately as the behavior of electrons following the laws of motion of quantum mechanics. This defines the properties of all substances also, and so that the whole theory of the properties of ordinary substances and the chemical properties and so forth have all been reduced to the motion of electrons. In the meantime, the theory of light and its interaction with matter, which was Maxwell's equations, had to be modified to become a quantum theory also. Oh, I forgot to mention that during this time, uh, one, to somewhat to one side of the way I want to go in these lectures, I would, I'm not going to discuss much about relativity, but the theory of relativity was developed, and that just makes it easier for us to guess laws. It tells us if we know how something varies in space, then we know how it varies in time, or vice versa that there's a nice relationship between the behavior in space and behavior in time, and that it's all sort of different aspect of the same geometrical thing called space-time. At any rate, Dirac, using the principles of relativity and, new quantum, and the new quantum mechanics, found a wonderful theory, the simplest possible thing you could write down for the motion of electrons, uh, Dirac's theory of electrons, and uh, that was the situation about 1927 or 8. But uh, the problem of the interaction of electrons with light, which was a complete quantum theory of electrodynamics, in other words, make Maxwell's equations of the light, of electricity and magnetism, and the theory of motion of electrons, all into one grand theory, was accomplished in 1929 in the theory was, that was called quantum electrodynamics. Trouble with it was, nobody could figure anything out, or better. When they did figure it out, they got nutty answers. If you didn't do it too carefully, you got a reasonably good answer for a problem. But if you carried it out very carefully, you would get some silly answer like zero or infinity or absolutely absurd results. This strikingly lasted for 20 years while people tried to figure out what the correct theory was. During this time, experimenters were measuring things more and more accurately. The theory of uh, the one of, they measured, uh, they found a few things with very subtle effects that the theory of interaction of light with electricity should explain. 